welcome. It's the first Sunday in August, and it's time for us to celebrate communion together. So I hope that you have your bread or cracker and your juice or water, and you'll be ready when we come together to the table after the sermon. Now let's open with prayer. Almighty God, you desire that in every place people should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Let our observance of communion be a faithful reflection of our peace-seeking and of our striving toward oneness with one another and with you. Help us in this hour of worship to bury our quarrels, to be purged of our envy or resentment, we bear, pray in the name of him who keeps praying that they may all be one so that the world may believe. Amen. And now let's join in that favorite communion hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together. Let us break bread together. Let us break bread together. God's word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So one year, instead of taking a, a vacation away somewhere, I took what is called a staycation. I stayed at home and I spent it cleaning house and painting rooms. And you know how it goes when you're cleaning house. you find stuff you've accumulated that you no longer need. So I took some of my old stuff, books, videos, dishes, down to the local thrift shop that our assistance ministry ran. And while I was there, I met one of our members who happened to be working there. She looked at all of it and she said, are you moving? I said, no, I'm just getting rid of my stuff. We all have stuff, don't we? And the longer we live in one place, the more stuff we seem to have. George Carlin reflects on that in his classic comic routine. He says, that's all I want. That's all you need in life is a little place for your stuff, you know. Everybody's got a little place for their stuff. This is my stuff. That's your stuff. That'll be his stuff over there. That's all you need in life, a little place for your stuff. That's all your house is, a place to keep your stuff. If you didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. A house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You can see that when you're taking off on an airplane. You look down, you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. And when you leave your house, you got to lock it up. Wouldn't want anybody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They never bother with that junk you're saving. All they want is the shiny stuff. That's what your house is, a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. Sometimes you got to move, got to get a bigger house. Why? 
no room for your stuff anymore. Does that hit a little too close to home? And what do we do when we need to, when we decide we have too much old stuff and need to make room for more stuff but can't get a bigger house? We have a rummage sale. What do you think Jesus would say about the stuff in our lives? Not just the physical stuff, but the emotional and spiritual stuff that accumulates too. Does any of our stuff help us live kingdom lives? Well, let's hear what Jesus has to say in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. From Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 and 24 through 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith? Therefore do not worry saying what we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring you worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Oh, words that I'm sure we have all heard before and words we all struggle to live by. Yet they're words Jesus practiced, traveling light and unencumbered by too much stuff or clutter. What I've learned is that we don't set out to collect stuff and let our lives get cluttered. It happens gradually as more things come in than go out. It's hard to let go of stuff, whether in our houses or in our lives. How is Jesus helpful in decluttering our lives of stuff? We have lots of stuff. The U.S. Census Bureau has kept track of the size of our houses over the years. In 1950, the average house was 893 square feet. Think about that. Some of us know what it's like to live in that house. Today, the average house has tripled to 2,537 square feet. While our houses have been getting larger, the size of the family has been getting smaller. In 1950, houses were built to give about 290 square feet per family member. Today, houses provide 971 square feet per family member. Think about that. Today, we give each person more space in a house than the whole house had 60 years ago. Nothing will motivate you to declutter your stuff more than moving will. Some people just throw everything in boxes and sort what they want and don't when they unpack. Not me. I declutter as I pack, and every time I move, the amount of what I want to take declines. Let someone else do the decluttering, and you'll see how much stuff you have. When I was leaving Hawkins to come to California, I knew that I couldn't take most of the food that was in my pantry. But man, it went against my grain to throw away 
uneaten food. So I asked a, a congregation member to come over and she said, how can I help? I said, you're going to think I'm crazy. But except for a couple of things, I need you to take everything on my pantry and throw it away. I can't take that stuff with me to California. She looked at me, she nodded, and she said, I got it. I got on. I, I, let me take care of it. And she did. We did something like that when my father moved out of his house. He'd lived in that house for more than 50 years, and he was now in assisted living, and we were going to have to sell the house. So it was time to clean it out. My sister and I had arranged for a dumpster to come from the city so that we could just dump everything in it. At the last minute, my dad said, I'd like to come with you. And I got to tell you, I didn't want him to come. I could just see him wanting to hang on to everything. But then I thought, you know, it's his house. It's his stuff. Okay. So we gave him a great job. We let him clean out the file cabinet. He got to decide what was important and what needed to go. My brother-in-law and I tackled the kitchen. And we started opening the drawers. And always, you know, I saw stuff in there that I had learned to cook with. And yet, as I looked at it, I realized it was pretty battered. I had better stuff to cook with. So I looked at Rob and I said, do you want any of this? He said, no, do you want any of this? I said, no. So we would just open drawers and take it and dump them in the dumpster. That kitchen was pretty empty when we finished. And you know, I don't miss the stuff I give away. Now, I, I bet something has been given away or, or, or thrown away that I might have kept if you'd asked me. But in the end, I haven't missed any of it. For me, this means I can go wherever the bishop sends me, and I have enough that wherever I am, I feel like I'm at home. And whatever I have will fit wherever I go. I still have some growing edges, though, particularly around books. My new rule for every book I bring in, one has to go out. Thank God we have a little free library. You know, the church is no different than us. It has stuff, too. And I'm not talking about the baptismal font or the picture that Mrs. Jones donated 100 years ago and that we hang in a spot as hidden as we can get away with to avoid offending her or any of her descendants who may still be going here. I'm talking about other kinds of stuff. Theologian and writer Phyllis Tickle wrote a book a few years ago called The Great Emergency. The Great Emergence. She noted that Every 500 years or so, the church feels compelled to have a giant rummage sale. And what she means is that oh, every 500 years, the church finds that its structures and institutions have become so cumbersome that they are an obstruction to its mis mission to make disciples. And in the process of holding a rummage sale, the faith is renewed and spread into new geographic or demographic places. Some might argue that this is what is happening in the United Methodist Church today as we grapple with churches disaffiliated and charge conference or general conference 2024 coming up. Questions are there. How do we streamline the church for ministry in the 21st century? What is cluttering us up? Our exterior clutter can also be a reflection of our spiritual clutter. For example, we tend to make discipleship a complicated, stuff-filled fixation. We've got creeds, doctrines, dogmas, rituals, denominational stances, liturgical dances, observances, saints, feast days, committee meetings, liturgies, political turf, pipe organs, worship bulletins, newsletters, and stained glass. Don't misunderstand me. All of these are good things. Just recently, we've added a creed back into our in-person worship. But they become clutter when they stop being the means and start being the end. If they are simply there for their own sake and obscure our relationship with God or with our neighbor, then they're becoming stuff that is cluttering up our lives. Happens in our spiritual life, too. Over time, I've added to my morning devotion time. I read four things every day. Daily devotional from Father Richard Rohr. The Upper Room Disciplines, a daily reflection from Eugene Peterson, and something from another writer. I just started a new book. 
and I've struggled recently with the writings from Eugene Peterson. They're very short, and frankly, they aren't speaking to me where I am spiritually right now, and yet I've resisted letting them go. Sometimes, you know, I need to read something that doesn't speak to me where I am spiritually because God wants to move me. Sometimes, the farther I go in, the more I discover. However, none of that seems to be true here. I've given it over seven months. So I've come to the decision that I'm letting it go. Something that has enriched us for a long time may have run its course. You know, our spiritual lives aren't static. They're always growing. In the same way that the books you enjoyed when you were in elementary school are not what you would pick up to read today, Sometimes our, our spiritual practices will need to change as well. But it's so hard to let go of the ones that nurtured us to this point. So we tend to keep adding and never letting go. I've learned the lessons of, or the value of decluttering from the home TV shows. You know, if you want to sell your house, declutter it. The same that's true with our spiritual life. Now, I know that you're all sitting there making mental resolutions to go home and clean out your closets. But there is a spiritual point to this, not just something to get you motivated to do a, a spring cleaning in August. Our spiritual lives need to be decluttered. And Jesus invites us in these verses to live kingdom-centered lives, free of the clutter that accumulates over time. He says to store up treasures in heaven, to let go of worry and trust in God, to live today fully and in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Jesus reminds us that stuff won't save us, not even religious stuff. Only He can do that. And Jesus wants us to know that we are enough. God made us in God's image. God declared us good. We don't need a lot of fancy clothing or decorations to show our worthiness. We already are. So how do we declutter our spiritual lives? Organization experts give advice about living in a clutter-free home. You've got to sort and evaluate on a regular basis. You know, if it's important to you, why is it in the back of a closet covered with dust? And if you haven't worn it in a year, give it away. The same is true for our spiritual lives. If you say a practice is important to your spiritual life, then do it. I hear people say they want to know the Bible, but they never read the Bible or include a Bible study in their schedule. And people are quick to add names to our prayer list, but then they don't take time to pray regularly themselves. In helping people get rid of the clutter, I've noticed the experts do something interesting. They often bring something in. They add. Maybe it's a new desk or closet organize, organizers, shelves, baskets and bins. Structure, in other words, to help stuff stay manageable. And again, the same is true for your spiritual life. If you want to study the Bible, attend a Bible study. We tend to com make, uh, keep commitments we make to others better than those we do just to ourselves. If you want to enrich your prayer life, set aside a specific time and a specific place to pray. Maybe even join others for a prayer circle. Structure supports your spiritual life and helps it stay focused, like a, a lattice that helps a vine be supported as it grows. Well, you know what happens after you declutter. Stuff begins to accumulate and the clutter begins all over again until, I don't know about you, but I just can't stand it anymore and I literally have to take a vacation to deal with it. And I vow every time this will be different. Is that the story of your spiritual life? You know, it can be different. Learn what is important and keep it. Discover what has outlived its usefulness to you. Acknowledge and honor how it's helped you grow spiritually. And then pass it on to someone else who needs it. Now, I invite you to close your eyes and visualize your spiritual life like your house. What room needs some attention?
what do you need to do to get it in shape? What will it take to keep it that way? Are you willing to do it? Amen. Now, as we prepare for communion, I'd like you to get your elements, your beverage and your um, bread, and let us go to God. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and seek to grow into his likeness. Let us draw near with faith, make our humble confession, and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but in your unfailing mercies. We are not worthy that you should receive us, but give your word, we shall be healed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Lift up your hands and give thanks to the Lord our God. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you made us in your image to love and be loved. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son, Jesus Christ, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus took, gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there are many, the bread that we share is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is the cup of our salvation. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Most bountiful God, we give you thanks for the world you have created, for the gift of life, and for giving yourself to us in Jesus Christ, whose holy life, suffering and death, and glorious resurrection have delivered us from slavery to sin and death. We thank you that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you have fed us in the sacrament, united us with Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. We are your children, and yours is the glory 
now and forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now where will we go and who will we be? We go out into the world to be God's people. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will keep you today and forever. So do not worry. Amen.